I'm Keith Richberg. I'm the director here at the Journalism and Media Studies Center. Thank you very much for joining us in this uh, webinar, our JMSC webinar, coming to you from our brand new production studios here in Hong Kong. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about who I am because I'm going to be with you for the next uh, hour or so that we're together. Uh, I'm Keith Richberg. Uh, I spent 33 years with the Washington Post as an editor and, and reporter, but mostly as a foreign correspondent. I was in some, uh, I was all over the world really. I was in Afghanistan, um, I was in Iraq, um, I was in Afghanistan after the fall of the Taliban, actually, both uh, after the U.S. military intervention. I've gone back subsequent times there. I was in uh, Beijing as well, um, Beijing and Shanghai. I also managed to get into North Korea a couple of times over the years. I also spent time in Africa in the 1990s. I was in Somalia and Rwanda. Um, I, um, you know, I covered Africa and produced a book out of that called Out of America not a plug. Uh, and uh, I also was in, uh, in places like uh, uh, New York. I was based in Paris for a while. But in uh, 2013, I decided to switch to the academic track. And I ended up here in Hong Kong at the JMSC because I quite frankly thought this was one of the most exciting times to be back in Asia, a place where I'd spent about uh, 15 or 20 years. And I also thought this was a really exciting time to be uh, teaching journalism. So to be teaching journalism here in Hong Kong was something that was uh, too, much to, too much to resist. And I'm, I'm joined here uh, tonight. I'm going to talk a little bit about our program and take your questions, but I want to just introduce to you. I'm joined here tonight by three of our current Masters MJ students here. I'll just start with you. Why don't you introduce yourselves and we'll come back to you. But Robert, just you know, give us a little bit about yourself, where you come from, and how you ended up here. Thank you, Keith. Hi, everybody. My name is Robert. I came from Toronto, Canada. I was born in China. I moved to Toronto 16 years ago, and I came to JMSC September last year. Thanks, Robert. My name is Tamsin Bergman, and I'm also coming from Canada. I spent the past eight years working for Canada's national newswire, the Canadian Press, in Vancouver, British Columbia. But I wanted to expand my horizons and do international reporting, so here I am. Uh, I'm Xin Mei. I'm from mainland China. Uh, I spent the last four years in Beijing during my undergraduate, uh, majoring in broadcasting in English. and then. And I, I decided to learn more about journalism. And I always loved Hong Kong. So yeah, here I am. Thank you. I've always loved Hong Kong, too. <laughs> Robert, Tamsin, Shinmei, we'll come back to you. And I'm sure uh, some, of the, some of our uh, prospective students listening in will have some questions for you guys. They don't want to hear from me. But uh, first, let me tell you a little bit about our program, because we're really proud of it here. It's, uh, we were founded in 1999, so we're relatively new. But we think we've got something really special going on here. Uh, at JMSC, we, we have about 70 to 80 MJ students, our master's students. We try to keep it 80 or under because that allows us to give real uh, full-time attention uh, to all of our students. So we're about, we're about a quarter the size of Columbia University, for example, so that really gives us a chance to have one-on-one -on -one contact with the students a, a lot more than some of the other schools that are a little bit bigger than we are. Um, it's one year, one year, one academic year, meaning you start in September, you're done at the end of May. Uh, most of our students come full-time, although there are a few uh, part-timers who do it over the course of two years. Uh, we've got nine full-time faculty members, uh, about seven professors and a couple of uh, lecturers. Uh, but we follow the Columbia model, meaning we mostly use a lot of adjuncts and visiting professors. And these are professionals who are currently working in the business who take some time to come here and, and teach our students. Um, so that's kind of our teaching model. Uh, you know, I'll, let you, I'll tell you a little bit about why, why I, I came here, really, from after 33 years of the Washington Post, why I think this place is really unique. And first of all, it's the vision of JMSC. Uh, it's a place that's really telling Asia's story. Uh, we're here in Hong Kong in this beautiful place. We're right on the footstep of China at a dynamic time. We're also overlooking Southeast Asia and the South China Sea and the, and the Taiwan Strait. Um, anybody who's been following the news knows how much Asia is in the news these days. And I can't think of a more exciting time to be covering Asia with all that's going on in 2017. Uh, secondly, you know, we focus on journalism. Unlike other uh, journalism schools, you, you won't find advertising here. We don't teach marketing. We're not teaching public relations. It's all about journalism. It's all about skills building. Skills building, and also we have some content courses too, involving you know covering China, covering global affairs, and finally, you know, we have a very international. Uh, student body, as you saw here from it. We had a couple of Canadians and, and one from mainland China here, but you know, we've got a world-class program, an international student body, and, but we also have an international faculty. Now, let me tell you first about the students, because those are the ones we're most proud of here. And as I mentioned, they come from everywhere. You met a few of them, uh, right, a couple of them right here. 
Uh, we have about 48% who come from mainland China next door. That number goes up and down a little bit. It's about 48% this year. It's a little lower last year. Um, we see where it is every year, but you know, always somewhere around that number or slightly less. Uh, about 28% from here in Hong Kong. These are our local students and we really encourage them to come and apply and, and be with us as well. And we pr probably have around every year about 25% international students. And our international students really come from everywhere. Um, I think this year we have students from Mexico, from Russia, from, from Peru, from the Netherlands, uh, from India, from Cambodia. Um, you know, last year we had students from Nepal and El Salvador. So our, our international students really come from everywhere. And we're really glad about that mix too. We really like that international aspect of our program. <coughs> Uh, our students come from a diverse range of backgrounds. About half or slightly more are fresh grads or maybe just out of, just out of undergraduate school or maybe one or two years out. Uh, we have about 21%, so about one-fifth of them or so come with some journalism experience. Many of them have worked at news organizations. Some, you know, some of them are actually older and have been in journalism for a long time. Uh, we've had some you know, in, their, in their 50s who are coming back in to refresh their digital skills. And then we have... Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, we have about 26% who come from other professions, uh, finance, law, uh, you know, we've had, I've had a police officer, I've had a Cathay Pacific flight attendant, they've come really from all kinds of other professions uh, to get into journalism. They see the JMSC as a good uh, bridge to make that leap from whatever they were doing into journalism. Uh, as I mentioned, our teaching, our faculty uh, here, our teaching staff, is very, very international. Uh, we have all kinds of accents up on the second floor of our home at Elliott Hall. Yeah, I'm American, we have Americans, we have British, we have uh, Canadians, we have Japanese. Uh, you know, we, they come from pretty much everywhere and a diverse range, and China as well, and they come with a diverse range of, uh, of journalism backgrounds from video to, to, to newspapers to radio, uh, places like Was Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, uh, we've got an Oscar-winning uh, Oscar filmmaker, documentary filmmaker, Ruby Yang, who teaches our documentary film program here. So if you're interested in becoming a, uh, the next Michael Moore, you can come and take documentary film with her. And uh, India, uh, Thomas Abraham. So really, from all over the place. So we've got a very, very diverse uh, teaching faculty, and I'm really we're proud of that. Now, what will you learn if you decide to come here to the JMSC and spend, uh, spend a year with us? Well, we, fo we focus firstly on the core skills that you need to go into journalism. Now, you don't come here and go into silos. You don't come here and only be a writer or only do video. You, you do everything, especially in the first semester. That means you do a reporting and writing course that's mandatory for everybody, compulsory course, also video course, a video broadcast television course, and a digital course, meaning everybody who comes gets digital skills, uh, so you'll be able to know how to you know, put together you know, websites, video skills, you'll know how to cut, edit, shoot, and reporting and writing skills so you'll learn basic news stories. So everybody who graduates from JMSC has those basic skills as well as uh, media law and ethics, uh, which we think is really vital to have. Now in the second semester is when you can really start having the specialization. And you, we have more skills courses. You can go and do advanced uh, reporting and writing. You can do long form narrative and feature writing. You can do photojournalism, which is a, an elective course here. Documentary production, as I mentioned. Data journalism. Long form feature writing, I mentioned. Uh, and business and finance. That's one of our core, uh, our core areas here. <clears throat> in, addition to those, uh, in, in addition to those skills courses in that specialization category, we also have kind of uh, what we call content courses. That means covering China, for example, or covering global affairs, covering health health science and medicine. So those are some of the content courses that we're really proud of. And then finally, this all, cumul this all the accumulation of all this is the capstone project. That's kind of, think of that as a master's thesis. It's the one thing that you will work towards your entire second semester, spend the month of May putting it together, and that really becomes the capstone of your portfolio. So the capstone project, the specializations, and then starting out those core skills. So that's kind of what we call the pyramid of learning here at the JMSC. <coughs> One thing we are really, really proud of here and that really has been a draw for a lot of our students here are the internships. And you can talk to our, some of our students who are sitting here with us tonight about the internship programs. We're really proud of that. Uh, we, we have a partnership with a lot of uh, uh, media companies that take interns from us every year. Those include International New York Times here in Hong Kong, CNN, Quartz, uh, uh, Atlantic Monthly. Uh, Ma Malaysia Kini, now I mentioned Malaysia Kini and Mazima because those are actually outside of Hong Kong. We have partnerships with uh, places in Malaysia, within Nepal, in Cambodia, 
in Myanmar that also take our interns, in addition to uh, places like the FT, Reuters, RTHK. I think Robert worked there over the uh, winter break. So almost you know, all of our students who are interested get an opportunity to do an internship either during that winter break or often after the uh, term ends. So our internships also very frequently lead to jobs. So the internship program is something that we really believe in here. We really believe in experiential learning, which is learning by doing. Now we have a lot of industry partners too. Uh, industry partnerships, I have, we have one now with AFP, the French news agency. Atlantic Quartz, which I mentioned, they're actually headquartered here. That's what we call a teaching lab, a journalistic teaching lab incubated right here at JMSC um, for their Hong Kong Bureau. Uh, we are a Google News Lab partner. And also we started, started a new partnership with Asia Sentinel, which is an award-winning uh, Asia-focused website right here in Hong Kong. So if you go on the Asia Sentinel website right now, you will see stories by JMSC students appearing right there on their home page. So please go up and check that out. Our graduates get jobs too, uh, and you know, if you go back and look at you know, the last statistics we had, we've got about 53% or so of our grads uh, from the 2015, last year's class, are now working in journalism, so that's a pretty good record. Another uh, 7 or 8% every year go into uh, academics, some right here doing research in media issues right here at JMSC. Uh, we got uh, about another 7% or so who are doing freelance work. And then they go into uh, about 12% we may have lost track of. So if you're listening on the webinar, let us know where you are. And then others go into things like internet, uh, advertising, they start their own companies. But we've got a pretty good track record. Our alumni are everywhere. They're at the New York Times, they're at Bloomberg, they're at Reuters, they're at the South China Morning Post. Uh, you know, we've got, uh, we've got some at BBC. I think the bureau chief in uh, Argentina is one of our grads. In Japan, we have people working for us. Uh, we have somebody in the United Nations Development Program in Bangkok working for us, so that, uh, who was one of our grads. So that shows you the, the skills we teach you as, as a journalist here at JMSC are transferable a lot of different places. So it, if you go on our website, you'll see you know, some of the stories about where some of our grads have ended up. But you know, our grads get jobs, they get out there, they're in the world now. Um, I'm really surprised every time I go to a conference or event, I get approached by people saying, yeah, I went to JMSC you know, five years ago or 10 years ago. <laughs> If you come here too, you also get to meet some of the leading industry figures. We have a lot of people coming in, a lot of people come through Hong Kong and we grab them to come up here and spend some time with our students. Um, you know, over the last few years, you, we've had Ethan Zuckerman here, we've had uh, famous photographer Nick Ut. Uh, Kevin Delaney, the, who started, the founder of Quartz Media, came here and talked to our students over a seminar about the freelance writing. And as I mentioned earlier, we've got a Oscar winning filmmaker, uh, Ruby Yang. Um, who's a documentary film, uh, film winner from the Oscar category. She teaches a documentary course here. I've been trying to get Ruby to loan me her Oscar so I could go to some of those Oscar parties at LA, but she won't loan it to me yet. Now, in addition to all the work you're gonna do, and you will, you will be working pretty hard, you'll have a lot of fun. Uh, it's, it's, it's really a fun group here. And uh, you know, we do try to take a few breaks off. We try to make sure that everybody can get together and uh, you know, share their stories after the internships, for example, when they come back in January. And, you know, we'll have other occasions where people will get together and order pizza. So it's, it's a fun program. We're not all work here. And you get some great opportunities to travel. You're in Hong Kong, right? Now, uh, I'm going to take some of your questions. And we've got this, uh, my crack team is working in the booth back here to answer your questions. And we've got these great students waiting for you. I'll try to answer a couple of your questions that I probably know you've got on the top of your mind right now. Most important, it always comes down to show me the money. How much does it cost to come here? Uh, if you're a non-local student, meaning you're not in Hong Kong, you're, you're listening to us from China or the U.S. or Canada or elsewhere, it's about $21,600. Uh, we think that's a bargain compared to some of the other uh, J schools in the U.S. Um, we think that's a, it's a good deal and for what you get, value for money, especially with all the great stuff you learn here in our, our crack team of, uh, of instructors. If you're a local student from Hong Kong, you get a little bit of a break, $19,200 for the term coming up. It requires 60 credits for you to complete the program. And then uh, I know some of you are asking, uh, are there any scholarships available? We do have a few. Uh, we ask you to go ahead, complete the application process first. And then if you get an admission offer, which we make in March, uh, then we'll let you know about scholarship possibilities. <coughs> now there are a few dates for you to remember. Application deadline is the 31st of January of this year. So it's, it's, it's coming up. And so uh, if you're going to go off and celebrate Chinese New Year, which I think starts around the 27th or 28th, you might want to get that application in beforehand, before the year of the rooster comes along. Uh, the qualifying exam is uh, in February, and uh, we'll tell you more about that or you can, you know, in the question and answer period. Then we will do some interviews. 
in February and March. Uh, if you're in Beijing and Shanghai, uh, myself or one of my colleagues will come there personally and do one-on-one -on -one interviews. If you're in Guangdong, we might ask you to come over here to Hong Kong, take a little trip and see us. If you're scattered around the world and we can't get to you, we'll probably do a Skype interview with you. And then we'll probably make our offers around March. So sometime in March, we'll let you know whether or not you've made the cut. You can come and join us. So, you know, stay connected with us. Uh, check out our website, jmsc.hku.hk. Uh, check out our Facebook page. I hope you saw that great Facebook Live uh, uh, broadcast that was done earlier. You please do follow us on Twitter because we do make announcements there and we'll let you know things, especially about deadlines, etc. We're on Twitter at JMSCHKU. On Instagram, we're there too. We're on LinkedIn. And also, please, subscribe to our YouTube channel because there are a lot of cool videos up there. You can see what some of our interns have done over the, over the uh, course of their internships. You can see a lot of good stuff up there as well. So stay connected. And uh, I think it's about time for us to start seeing if there's some uh, questions. I think maybe the team has been answering some of your questions that you've been putting in there already now. But uh, anything to add, guys, over there? I think we're going we're gonna to wait and see if we get a few questions coming in here. Let's see. I see a few being answered here now. Some people saying they're thinking of applying full-time. They want to know whether to go full-time or part-time. Who, who else is poking in here? They want to know about elective courses. Why don't, we, uh, why don't we talk about some of your experiences now? I know some of you have done some things over the last couple of weeks here now, right? What were you doing? Robert. Over the winter break, I've been interning at RTHK Radio 3. And as somebody who's been dreaming about becoming a broadcaster, that was a dream come true for me. And over the, uh, in my first semester, I chose broadcast journalism as one of my selected courses. And I really enjoy working with the professor, Matt Walsh. And yeah, just follow your dream and go with your wh whatever you're interested in. Excellent. And Thompson, where were you? I've actually just uh, one week ago started uh, work at the International New York Times. Nice. It's absolutely something I'm ecstatic about and so thrilled that this opportunity could happen thanks to everybody pulling for me hard here at the JMSC. So I'm actually going to be work. I have started working for the op-ed section. It's uh, now gone to three pages because it's a very well-read section and I am doing very thorough editing and, man and uh, fact-checking of manuscripts from contributors. I'm doing proofing. I am looking over everybody's shoulder and learning everything I possibly can from the people in that newsroom. And I will be doing this actually for several months to come. They've signed me on for six months already, so it's unbelievable. Excellent. Shinmei, you've got something cool coming up, is that right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I didn't exactly do a winter internship, um, but I'm doing the internship uh, starting from next week at, at uh, The Information. It's a business news site, a sort of tech media. And the information, yeah. well known. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited about it. And you just had a story published in U.S. News? Is oh, yeah, right. Uh, because the winter internship was sort of uh, running late, uh, there were some... Uh, so anyway, I talked to our... I talked to Kevin, our... Internship, internship coordinator? Yeah. Coordinator, yeah, I was going to say internship guy. Uh, yeah, uh, I, so I talked to him. I said, I'm going to have some free time, so is there anything I can help out with? Uh, so he told me that US, U.S. News and World Report is looking to run a story about uh, the elderly population in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And he asked me uh, if I had any story ideas. Mm -hmm. And I just remember that I did this story. I did a story during the semester for the video news production course. Um, I, yeah, it was about a modeling agency in Hong Kong that mm -hmm. recruits only elderly models. So yeah. <laughs> It, it was pretty cool. So I told him about all about that modeling agency, and um, I also showed him the video that I made. Mm -hmm. And he said, y "Yeah, th this could probably work." And mm -hmm. so he put me put me in touch with the editor at US News, and uh, we sort of worked through the story to ma make some tiny changes mm -hmm. to it so that it could be published. That's so great. yeah, like a week later, and Ke Kevin was all there to help mm -hmm. me all along. 
That's great. Like, so what was it like seeing your name up there in U.S. News? That was really cool. Hey. <laughs> you know, we're really proud of those industry partnerships. You know, I mentioned industry partnerships as part of the program. You know, because, you know, with, with AFP, with Quartz, uh, you know, with uh, the Asia Sentinel, with U.S. News, you know, our students come here and they work, but you're not just writing for the classroom. We're actually trying to get your work out there and get it published. So that's one of the things here. I've got a few questions rolling in, so maybe I can ask, I can pitch it to some of you guys. Uh, one question is, uh, I'll ask you, uh, Shen Mei. Someone's writing in to say, uh, for those who might be coming, who might be using English as a second language, is English a concern in practicing English journalism? Uh, what do you think? <laughs> well, I would say it indeed it is because it, it's definitely challenging for a non-native English speaker to do a course in English, mm -hmm. as you can see, I'm, I'm not that fluent, but, uh, You're but it's fluent. also, <laughs> it's challenging, but it's fun. You get to learn a lot during, during, mm -hmm. so okay. yeah, I, I think that's something you have to work on if you mm -hmm. want to uh, mm -hmm. do this course, but okay. uh, you, I'm, I'm sure they, they can do it. Okay. Well, Robert, you speak every known language, right? No, <laughs> I, I speak four languages. She speaks four languages. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. A couple other questions coming here. Uh, it says, um, some people are asking about data journalism courses um, and, and the data, fun data journalism fundamentals. Um, some people are saying they'd like to choose uh, multimedia subjects and what do we do about data journalism? I think we're really proud of our data journalism. Anybody want to, Tempson, you want to speak on that? Well, I would say that that's something you definitely do want to engage in. It's one of the reasons that I am finding great value from this program because I was in the industry for eight or 10 years, whatever it's been now, a lot has changed for me and I actually hadn't really had the perspective of what had happened while I was grinding out stories day after day. So I took all of us, we've taken the digital journalism class, which is one of the um, mandatory mm -hmm. classes in first term and that in itself just blew my mind to be quite frank. Mm -hmm. um, but now coming up, there's several more classes in that realm. I'm gonna be taking the data journalism course and I'm excited because we already had one lecture by the professor on that um, and she works at Google mm -hmm. and uh, really just vibrant energy there. I'm really excited to see what she has to mm -hmm. teach us, but I know there's also an, uh, some kind of entrepreneurial exactly class yeah. as well. Yeah, because Google is one of, I mentioned one of our industry partners. We've done a, we've done a MOOC and one of these massive online courses with Google. We're actually implementing another one soon. And, uh, you know, so, you know, we've got Google's person over here teaching data journalism with us. So we're really proud of that as well. There, there are a few more questions coming in here and a few more comments. I saw there were a lot of earlier comments thinking that, uh, uh, AJ from our staff is one of the best dancers in that video <laughs> early on, so we'll have to compliment AJ on his dancing skills here. Uh, several people are asking about part-time, coming part-time, and I would say that yes, you can come part-time, then you do the course over two years. Uh, we offer a lot of courses that are at night to accommodate our part-time students. So, you know, if you, if, you, if you are working, you're in Hong Kong, you're working, you can't afford to come out, uh, take a time off from the job to come full-time, that is a possibility as well. Most of our students, are, our MJs are full-time, but yes, we do have part-time students as well. And uh, somebody else is saying that uh, they'd love to take some of the China courses, like our Covering China course and the uh, multimedia courses as well. And they're wondering if the people get to, get to take what they want, if we can accommodate it. The answer is yes, we try to accommodate our students as much as possible, really. Um, you know, obviously some courses get full. You know, often if a course gets too full, if too many people subscribe, we can actually just chop the course in two and we'll get more instructors to come and we'll teach two sessions of the same course. So yes, you pretty much will get what you want to take here. We have a real menu of options at the JMSC and it changes too. You know, we try to keep up with the times, we try to keep up with trends, we put on new courses all the time. We offer new courses as instructors become available and as there's need. So if we think that people are really asking for a course, we'll find somebody to come in and teach it. Uh, let's see if there's some other questions here we can take on. Uh, do any of your courses like video news production teach presenting skills like on, on, on screen techniques? Absolutely. Uh, we've got Ann Kruger um, on our staff now. She's worked at Bloomberg TV and CNN and she's going to be teaching a course coming up uh, actually starting uh, in another couple of days on how to be a TV news anchor. 
and she's going to be teaching the skills that go in to be in front of the camera, but she's also going to be throwing in some, some production uh, skills as well. Um, and I think work both, both sides of the camera, and I think she's a firm believer in the fact that you have to know how to work on both sides of it. So yes, we do uh, teach, teach on-air skills as well. So if all of you people out there are thinking about being on there and being TV, product, uh, TV anchors or TV stars, you can come to us as well. And someone says, I've uh, got a, message, a question here from Sophie, asking, uh, Sophie asks, could you tell us more about business and financial journalism? Is it necessary to have an in-depth knowledge of finance-related matters, and how will the course provide us on that? Uh, you know, we, you know we, we're really, really proud of our business and journalism program. It's uh, mainly taught by, uh, by Jeff Timmermans, a longtime Dow Jones and Wall Street Journal correspondent who came here to work with us. We, we got him away from the Wall Street Journal to come here and work for us. Uh, we also have Jerry Doyle, who's a Wall Street Journal reporter here. And just for the semester, we're going to have uh, Tom Wright. Tom Wright, uh, we call him Mr. MB, uh, 1MBD. He discovered this Malaysian scandal, the 1MBD scandal for the Wall Street Journal and was a Pulitzer Prize finalist. He's going to be spending a semester here with us at JMSC. And he's going to be uh, doing some, go, going and talking to classes, supervising uh, students on their capstone projects, and being a, 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 a real resource for us here. So we're really proud of our business and financial journalism courses. We offer courses in both business reporting and in fi and international finance as well. And so we, uh, and, and a lot of our students, they're very popular courses. So that's why we have so many people coming here and doing business and finance. Um, let's see, we've got a question here from uh, Man Li. Can I know more about the photojournalism course? Well, photojournalism is taught by Case Metzelar. Uh, he's been out in Asia for about 25 years or so doing photojournalism. I first met Case uh, in the 1990s, uh, sorry, 1980s, covering the fall of the Marcos regime in the Philippines. And he's one of the top photojournalists in the world. And he's been here at JMSC, I think, for about eight years now, teaching the photojournalism course. Um, so, you know, he, and he's terrific. He's also very uh, active with the Foreign Correspondence Club. And every semester, I believe, he takes his photojournalism students over to the Foreign Correspondence Club to kind of rub elbows with some of the greats over there. Are any of you guys taking courses from Case? Uh, Want to say a word? Tamsin? Yeah, actually, um, we, okay, so both the, the courses that just were raised, both the financial and business okay. journalism courses and the photography courses, mm -hmm. um, I took both of those courses last term. Oh, please talk uh, about Shime, it. Shimei, though, also you were in Yeah, business. I was in the business class, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you move to no. business? Okay, so um, <laughs> I think, yeah, we might as well comment a little bit about those. Um, first of all, the photography course, uh, I was in that and definitely Case is a rock star. He's a lot of fun. Um, and I, why did I take that course? Because it was a skill that I have, again, never had a chance to develop. So being able to get my hands on a really high tech camera, learn how to use the DSLR. Some people just, you know, pick it up and they know how to do it, but I'd never gotten this opportunity before. There's a really good equipment room here. The, all our staff in the production studio right now are a dream to work with. Um, they set up a new system this year actually where we can go online and book what kind of equipment we need so it's very helpful i didn't have the cash for example to bring my own camera you can if you like mm -hmm. um, but with the photo class for example you go out and nearly every class you are using the equipment taking pictures and then getting immediate feedback um, Shimei, do you want to uh, mention anything about uh, we were both in jerry doyle's class mm -hmm. yeah uh, which was the Business, global business journalism. Global business journalism. Yeah, that that is actually the course that I think I learned the most from this semester. Um, yeah, basically because I literally just started from scratch. I didn't know anything about business journalism before. Uh, before, but it was. I'm sure it's pretty. Um, uh, it's it's just really how we cover uh, Jerry the. Professor Jerry Doyle, he covers a wide range of topics uh, regarding to global business, like um, uh, co com commodi commodity, commodities, yeah, commodities, financial crisis, just whatever you, you name it. Uh, yeah, I absolutely learned a lot from that course. Mm -hmm. and can, can I ask the questioner is asking, do you need to have a deep financial background to take those courses? What, what about you guys? Shinmei? I started from zero. Okay, Shinmei started from zero. zero. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, you don't need a lot of uh, deep financial business background knowledge. 
uh, before you take that course. But um, yeah, you can just go with the syllabus, go with uh, what the professor teaches you, and you will learn a lot. Great. Uh, let me look at a couple of other questions right here. Uh, let's see, somebody asked about the specialization courses and uh, do you graduate with a specialization like having a major or a minor on your certificate like at the undergraduate level? Not really, you basically just get the JMSC degree. Although people who did take all the business courses we did give a certificate to just saying they've completed all of the business courses. So we can, and so that's the one thing that we do. Um, on the website, oh, you know, I, I should mention as well, you know, somebody was talking about photography. Um, if you go to our student page on the JMSC website, I think we do have a display of some of the student photography work on there. So, uh, that, so if somebody who's interested in photography, please take a look at that. Check out Case's biography. Case, by the way, is spelled K-E-E-S, not K-A-S-E, it's a Dutch spelling. But check out Case Metzler's biography. Check out that student page on some of the photos there. Uh, let's see some of the other questions that are coming in here. We've got some coming in fast and furious, and not all of them have to do with AJ's dancing. <laughs> uh, is, it, is it possible to, uh, basically the, somebody's asking about the application deadline. Uh, somebody's asking about whether or not, oh, this is an interesting question, whether or not there's any Chinese language uh, courses that we can offer students. You know, that's a very interesting question because my, me and the team have just been discussing the possibility of adding something in uh, that where uh, some of our international students who don't speak Chinese might be able to come in earlier in July or August and take some kind of crash courses in Mandarin. And of course, this is the University of Hong Kong where they do offer uh, Mandarin courses. There is a Putong Law Center as well. So it's a very good question. Get back to us on that and we will try to see if we can accommodate you on that. And then, uh, so one question here going on from this earlier, an earlier question, uh, this is coming from Serena. She wants to know what percentage of your master's graduates would you say stay in Hong Kong to work? And I'd say quite a few actually stay in Hong Kong to work. Uh, this is interesting, if you're not from Hong Kong, and you guys can correct me, I think if you come here as a grad student, you're allowed to stay on for at least one year yeah. in Hong Kong, is that correct? I think you get a one year open work permit, and then during that year you can look for any employers to, I mean, you can contact any person to look for a job, and, but it's always better to get an employment letter before your graduation day. Yeah, no, absolutely. So you get to stay in Hong Kong, and that's one of the other benefits of coming here. You get to stay in Hong Kong for a year after graduating and work. And, and you know, I, I'm, I, I'm seeing here now, I think we've got a ten, about 10 uh, JMSC alumni now working at Bloomberg in Hong Kong. So it's good to keep in mind that Hong Kong is one of the places in the world where people are actually hiring people for jobs, especially in the financial journalism uh, sphere but everywhere else. So it's a good place to come. Uh, we have a lot of our grads working in Hong Kong at South China Morning Post, at Reuters, Bloomberg is one. So yes, some of our a lot of our grads stay here and work. Uh, you, and uh, you mentioned the visa. Oh, and also I should say that there are also a lot of startups in Hong Kong as well. A lot of, uh, I think you mentioned the information is a, uh, the new website that you're gonna be interning for. They've just started up here in Hong Kong. Quartz just opened their Hong Kong bureau and they've taken some of our JMSC grads. And there's a lot of there's a lot of in that kind of startup media space going on in Hong Kong, so yeah, it's a great place. I should say too, there's also the Hong Kong Free Press. I forgot to mention mm -hmm. that that was actually started by one of our JMSC grads, Tom Grundy, who incubated the Hong Kong Free Press site in one of our JMSC classes, wow. one of our most popular classes called uh, called Digital Media Entrepreneurship, where you actually learn how to uh, put up your own website, your own news website in the class. And Tom Grundy, uh, one of our graduates, came here and set up uh, the uh, Hong Kong Free Press. And they actually do, are looking to take some of our students as well. I've got a question here from Kelvin. He's asking, how many hours of classes and after class work would you say it takes to do it part time and full time, respectively? Um, it's a lot of work. I mean, you know, we usually say, you know, for every hour of class, you're going to have to put in a couple of hours outside of class. You know, we, uh, you know it's, a, it's, it's a lot of work because, you know, it, it, on the video class, you're going to be going out and shooting. Uh, Kevin Seitz, who teaches the video production class, has said that for every minute of video, you generally have to do an hour to two hours of shooting. And there's also a lot more post-production time involved in that. So you gotta, you're going to be really working a lot. And uh, somebody's asking whether it's going to be possible to, uh, or an affordable to uh, actually, I think Kelvin's asking, you know, do you want to do it full time? Do you want to do it part time? Uh, the part timers can stretch it over two years, so obviously that makes it a little bit easier. Um, but you know, full time is only really nine months, and so maybe sometimes it's better to just do a crash course. I'm going to turn that question to some of our students here. How many hours outside of class do you think you spend working, and what are the most intensive classes, Robert? 
I feel like in order to succeed in this program, you have to do a lot of work outside of classes. This, like what he said earlier, it's only a ninth month program. So in short, you have to work a lot, but I think it's all worth it because when you look back at what you've done, you will realize how much work you put into it and how much you've learned. That's the most important thing. There's yeah. definitely a steady flow of work outside the classroom. Mm -hmm. Shinmei, you're yeah. nodding. Steady flow, that's the Steady word I was, I was, work. <laughs> I was <laughs> looking for in my head. But yeah, I, I can't even count how many hours, <laughs> but, but it was definitely fun. Yeah. And yet at the same time, I think all of us probably still have managed to have experiences outside of the classroom and outside of our homework hours in which we've gone and explored some of Hong Kong, made new friends, and being able to at least soak in some of what Hong Kong has Definitely. to offer. Would that be true? Right. I, I concur with what both ladies have said. Mm -hmm. And I just have to say that you will have to deal with challenges, but eventually you make it. So I think just stay mm -hmm. tough and stay committed to this program. That's yeah. it. And you know, one of the reasons that that's possible uh, is because the instructors here want us to succeed. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I can say, even from my personal experience, that a number of different instructors and the director, et cetera, everybody has been, had sort of open door policies. They've taken me under their wing. And I really believe that there's a personal touch here. And that's something that anybody out there who is going, that's far away, I'm not sure. How am I going to feel? What if I am feeling a bit lost? You know, we. Right. I know I have, I can't speak for everybody else, but often you do far, start to feel lost at times when you're trying something new. And the great thing about this program has been that the instructors do care. But as a student, we're very supportive of each other and mm -hmm. we've been giving each other encouragement all the way. So I think you're gonna meet a lot of great people here. Mm -hmm. Well, great. We, we've got a couple more questions coming in here. Someone asked about the qualifying exams, which are always a tricky question. First of all, I think if you don't have English as a native tongue, we ask you to have a TOEFL exam score in there as well. And then there's a writing test. Now, and someone's asking how, you know, how you prepare for the writing test uh, and what, what it entails. It basically is to test your English language writing skills to see if you can sort of think in an analytical and clear manner and write some basic essays. We're going to ask you some news questions on there. Uh, the test takes place in Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangdong, and uh, also in Hong Kong. And then for overseas students, some of you will be allowed to take that writing and the qualifying tests uh, online, and we'll set something up for you to be able to do that. And if you survive the test, then you get the interview stage at the next level. So don't worry about too much about the test, but uh, keep those deadlines in mind. And then someone else, uh, Sheng Man Li, is asking, do, I recommend doing, do you recommend doing uh, full-time or part-time if I have a media-related job for now? And he's heard that some people that hands-on experience can be useful. Uh, how about combining, would combining both better or focusing on learning better or focusing on cultivating the skills? Wants to know which one of those would be better if he now has a media-related job. Good question. We have some media uh, professionals who are still working. We have the editor of a Hong Kong magazine um, who's taking our course right now, who you know, actually finishes the course and goes back to the magazine. Uh, we have others who have actually taken off from media related jobs, media jobs, good jobs to come here and work with us. Tamson, you've had that experience. I'm gonna let you answer that question because you that's right in your wheelhouse. It definitely is and it was a big decision. Um, those of you out there who are contemplating making major changes, I'm glad you're joining us in this webinar um, to ask your questions because I spent several years trying to determine how I would make um, a move forward to follow uh, my passion. And I mean, I, I'm here and I can tell you I'm happy that I'm here. It's, um, it, can, it, it can be, you know what, in North America anyhow, the industry is not looking good. I talk to my former colleagues all the time about the job losses and so before I came here and on the webinar last year one of my questions was about whether there would be job prospects. We, we need to survive, right? And so I was reassured by uh, the faculty that there 
are employment opportunities. Keith has talked about them. And from what I can see, there, there actually still is hope out here. There, is, there are still organizations that are hiring, and it's not quite as dismal as it's been where I come from. So people still think I'm a little bit crazy for making the move I did, but I do believe this was the right bridge for me, and so far I'm just going to keep at it, and I'm feeling really good about the decision. Excellent. And uh, a couple more questions here. Someone, uh, Joyce, she's reposting her question. Sorry about that, Joyce. Your question must have gotten lost there. She needs some feedback about documentary making. Are those involved with the documentary initiative accessible to students? Absolutely. Uh, they teach a course. Um, I think they're going to have about 30 students in the documentary course this year, and they will be also supervising some of the capstone students who want to do their capstone project in the documentary space as well. And uh, Ruby Yang, as I mentioned, is the head of that. Uh, she's a rock star, and she loves dealing with the students. In addition to uh, teaching a course on documentary uh, filmmaking, um, which is a really, really intensive course, uh, Ruby also takes some of the students in as her interns and works, they work with her in the course as well. So Ruby's a real rock star. She uh, does it with Nancy Tong. They do it jointly together. So we've got two top documentary filmmakers here teaching that course. So definitely uh, very accessible. Um, and you, uh, students also get to take the master class, the, doc uh, the documentary initiative also brings in uh, uh, Oscar-winning or Oscar-nominated uh, filmmakers from around the world twice a, a year, once every semester, and they put on master classes, uh, with, as we call them. So you can, uh, people from the public and students can work with them. They can bring in their own documentary projects to get feedback from these uh, real experts. So it's something that we're really the most proud of here. Now, if I can only get Ruby to loan me that statue, uh, the Oscar, because I want to <laughs> take that around. You know, you can actually get into any party after the Oscars if you're carrying an Oscar statue. So I just want to borrow hers and see if I can get in some of those cool parties. Um, uh, we have one question here so asking, uh, what qualities do you look for in applicants? That's a really great question. Uh, you know, we, are, we look for a variety of, of, of things. We basically want to see that people are really committed to journalism or going into journalism or have at least an interest in going into journalism. And we look, to, for, we look for people who are, you know, who have some kind of demonstrated passion or interest in coming and joining this family here and who we think would be a good mix for us as well. You know, the JMSC here, you know, we're relatively small, as I mentioned, both the staff and the, and the, and the students. And we like people, you know, we, we like to think of it as almost like a family. And once you, even once you leave here, we, just, we stay in touch with you. And, you know, we ask our alumni to come back and chat with us and be a part of this group. But mainly we're looking for people who have that kind of journalistic passion, um, something that they really want to, uh, want to accomplish in journalism. Some, you know, I, I looked at the personal essays that I asked all of you guys to write to, for me, and I could see all, you know, everybody had a real sense of passion or empathy or some stories they wanted to tell or they, they, they were concerned about marginalized peoples or they were concerned about discrimination or discrimination against the handicap or the LGBT community. They wanted to tell stories. They wanted to tell the stories of people, and, uh, and, and they were curious. Um, they weren't people who were just comfortable sitting at home or getting a job working in the insurance company. They wanted to go off and uh, do something that really made them feel passionate. Uh, let me, can I ask you about the, Robert, start with you. What, what do you think? What, what drove you to journalism? Because you had that kind of thing we were looking for. Like I said earlier, I've always been wanting to become a broadcaster and having lived in Canada for the past 16, uh, 16 years, the rarity of seeing somebody who remotely looked like me on a uh -huh. TV screen uh -huh. somehow made me more determined uh -huh. to put myself out there to be seen or heard by the masses. And I think that if you want to pursue a career in journalism, you have to really love it. Because one of my favorite Chinese-American journalists, Lisa Ling, she said before that if you want to pursue a glory or if you want to make money, this is not the industry that you want to get into. Uh -huh. But if you want to tell story, if you want to be a good storyteller, you want to, if you want to be the voice for those who are voiceless, then you should defi uh, definitely be a journalist. So I share the same passion with Lisa and hence why I'm here. Uh -huh. I'm going to ask you that question too, Thompson. Passion. Well, well I, I appreciate the quote that Robert's just <laughs> given us. Um, I used to make jokes about how if I have to, I will happily sleep in a mud puddle for a story. And I, I still mean that. Um, 
being able to go into all kinds of different places, talk to people from all realms of life, and have the ability to give them voice, um, to be able to express ideas that other people will read and hopefully think about and perhaps even act upon that could have some kind of meaningful impact. Like that's it, you can hear it in my voice. Um, I just, I, I find that to really mean something to me and to my life. And when you package that with telling it as a story that's engaging and maybe you're taking photos or you're writing beautiful sentences, beautiful prose, shooting the video, editing it together. There is something also that's glorious about creating the product and then seeing it out there in the world. So the craft of it as well um, just speaks, speaks to me. And so there's so many different reasons that this profession is worthwhile getting into. And I think um, we all can look at the world and see that there's plenty of reasons that we all need to be doing it. Okay, I've got a couple more questions coming in. Shinmei, I'm going to surprise you with this question over okay. here first, and then the others can chime in if they want. Here's one. How do you survive in Hong Kong, and how much does it cost to live in Hong Kong? <laughs> how do I survive in Hong Kong? <laughs> how do you survive in Hong Kong? And how, what, what, was it a culture shock coming here? I mean, you're not coming from far from the mainland, but yeah. I think it may be coming from mainland students, too. They want to know, is it easy to live here? Easy to find an apartment? <laughs> <laughs> I never I never found it too hard to make the transition. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that big of a transition, actually. Um, and how much it takes, I'm really not sure. I, I wasn't counting. <laughs> <laughs> not counting. Yeah. It's, actually, it's cheaper than New York, I think, which is the last <laughs> place I lived. <laughs> how you guys, have you, how you guys adjusted coming from Canada to Hong Kong? Is it easy? For me, Robert, <laughs> I'm st I think I'm still in a transitioning period. Mm -hmm. I've been to Hong Kong before. I come, I've come here for as a visitor before, but I think it's definitely a transi transition for somebody who's coming from North America mm -hmm. because, first of all, you have to deal with the lack of physical space yes. in the streets. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I'm still struggling to get used to at times. But as time goes on, I begun to appreciate the vibrancy of this uh -huh. metropolis has to offer. Uh -huh. So you, there's, you gain something, but you have to be willing to sacrifice something in, in order to achieve your goal. Uh -huh. Do you agree with that, Tamsin? That's really well said. Um, <laughs> not only like lack of physical space, maybe that you're talking about the streets, but yeah. in the apartments, it is <laughs> tiny. I am going to say one of the most challenging things probably for me is the cost. Uh, you do have to be realistic about it. I am basically paying this, the same amount it, um, for the apartment that I had in downtown Vancouver, which was larger. Um, I'm paying that, but not just me. Um, my boyfriend's actually moved out here to be with me and support me in my dream here. And the two of us are both paying that cost. So we're essentially paying double for a smaller space. Uh, it makes you sometimes suck in your breath, um, but there are ways to do it. You can get roommates. Um, you don't have to live right next to the university, which, okay, that's what I'm doing. Um, you can find delicious, cheap food, and I figured out ways to ensure my budget stays reasonable. I cook at home as much as possible. So um, I would, frankly encourage you to look at the scholarship section of the website. Um, that may help. There are ways to do it. And I will agree, though, that the cost of this program compared to several of the other programs in other very good schools around the world is much more reasonable. So maybe that's going to be what is offsetting the cost. That's a good point. And you know, one other, one other thing I would off offer, too, is you know, um, for people who are interested in Asia or even interested in China, Hong Kong is, kind of, and especially from Western countries, Hong Kong is kind of an easy first step. Um, you, you don't get the great culture shock in Hong Kong that you might get going immediately to Beijing or immediately to Shanghai or even immediately to Jakarta. 
you know, Hong Kong is a very, uh, it's, it's the most modernized, westernized city in Asia. It's the most sophisticated city. So it's kind of that easy first step. So it's a great place for people to figure out if they want to do Asia really or not. Um, just a couple of more things here, uh, a couple of more students, uh, uh, student questions or, or prospective student questions coming in. Oh, this is as, uh, for the students in the room. That means I do less work and I can turn it over. <laughs> Would you mind sharing uh, what you studied in your undergraduate degrees? And secondly, did you already have some specialist knowledge, like in political science or social sciences, before deciding to join this program? Uh, un undergraduate degree, Robert? I actually studied political science at York University in Toronto, Canada. And I also studied French back in Can at Toronto, too. I, when I was in Toronto, I only had this passion for journalism. But I did volunteer for CIUT, 89.5 FM, University of Toronto radio station, for eight years. Mm -hmm. So I got a bit of taste of what it was like to be working in a media environment. So yeah. OK. Um, I have two degrees already. I, my undergrad was also in Canada. I did film studies and psychology, but I was doing journalism while I was at the school. I was on the student paper, and I always said that I was a, not a student doing journalism, but like a journalist doing school. Um, that's me. Uh, and then I went on because I was quite young, um, still young, hopefully. Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> Ten years later, apparently, here I am. Um, but I actually did a, a special program that was in Toronto that was a journalism program, but it was for students who already had an undergrad degree. Um, and then, of course, I went off and worked in the industry, but at the same time, now, again, the reason that I've come here is because I really wanted to upgrade my skills and work with international content, and that's not something that I had been doing, so that's how I landed here, uh, getting uh, a third degree. Mm -hmm. Shinmei, what did you study? Uh, um, my undergraduate major was uh, English broadcasting. Uh, it was a lot of English learning. And then uh, there were also some media-related courses, so that gave me sort of a media background, I guess. And um, yeah, and I did some journalism internship during the four years of undergrad, so that's what pushed me here, actually. Mm -hmm. May I just um, make sure that we answer the question, because I believe they asked yes. also about the specialty and if that's yes. required. Right. And I would say, that it's not, if that's what you're worried about. I still wouldn't say that I have a specialty. I don't know about either of you, if you think that's something that's necessary. Of course, it's not gonna hurt. In fact, it's lovely when you do, because then if you have a specialty in something that you're passionate about, you can perhaps then pursue that line of journalism. Mm -hmm. But it's certainly not something that should hold you back in any way. I think Tenson just mentioned the key word there, mm -hmm. passion. You have yes. to have passion, you have to have interest in doing in pursuing a master's degree in journalism for yourself, not for your parents, not to please anybody else, but yourself. And if you have the passion for it, I think mm -hmm. you're the right fit. That's right. Yeah, and, and I should, I should uh, let, let the audience know that, you know, in addition, when you come here to JMSC, in addition to taking our great courses, well, we also are affiliated with the uh, Faculty of Social Sciences. So you can also take some courses in the Social Science faculty, whether that's uh, you know, international relations courses or Chinese history courses or other courses there as well. So we're really integrated with the social sciences faculty. Uh, let's see if we have any more questions here. We've got a few more coming in, but we're going to run out of time soon. Um, let's see. Um, nothing else dealing with uh, AJ's dancing skills here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, people, <laughs> various people are asking about the, uh, um, you, know, how, you know, how it works in terms of payment. Um, people are asking uh, how far in advance the tuition fees need to be paid. I think their able staff back there is answering some of those questions. Um, oh, really, oh, I've got a great question here I'm going to save until last. That'll be our closing question. And uh, <laughs> I'll answer that one here. Uh, some of the fresh grads are asking, do I think work experience is going to be helpful or not? You know, it doesn't hurt, but we also have a lot of, uh, I think I showed the slide there that showed how many fresh grads we have. We have some who come straight out of uh, uh, undergraduate school who have never studied journalism before. Some have studied journalism as well. So we have a really, I think it's a really good mixture actually. And uh, I'll follow a follow-up question from the one who asked that last question. Do you think 
She asked, do you think, uh, he or she, do you think a, the specialist knowledge is important for finding story angles at all? Is specialist knowledge important for finding story angles or can anyone find good stories? I think you just have to, go, I think you just have to go with your gut. Of, of course, when you're taking a class such as the video production course, the professor will let you know what kind of story that you can work on, on a pragmatic, uh, pragmatically. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you're the one who has to, who has to go out to look for storyline. Mm -hmm. So you have to go with your passion, go with your interest in order to build the story from scratch, mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. So just go with your gut, go with what you're interested in, and I don't think you will be too far up the track. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts? Specialist knowledge, like I said, never hurts. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, it may be your starting point uh, because if you have some kind of in-depth knowledge on a certain topic, then likely you know more than the average bear about it, you know more than me about it, and therefore you can follow that instinct that I think Robert was talking about, certainly to dig in and find a good story, but it's all about just keeping your eyes and ears open all the time, having that curiosity that Keith talked about, listening to everything, walking a different route to school, you never know what you're gonna spot, so, Again, I think I just want to assuage any fears that if you don't have some kind of specialty that you can't do it, you absolutely can. You just got to keep your mind open and then pitch, pitch, pitch. <laughs> yeah, I agree 100% with what Tamsin just said. Um, having specialized knowledge is of course going to help you develop your, develop your own story ideas, I would say, but if you don't have special, specialized knowledge that's absolutely fine. I think you just have to pay attention to things. If, if, if you already have the passion for journalism, you, you, you will just naturally have story ideas, right? Mm -hmm. you, you're curious about things and uh, yeah. just read a lot and pay attention to things. That's mm -hmm. what I would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I've saved the last question for last uh, for myself here. Uh, Napat asked, I uh, hope I'm pronouncing your name right. What is your perspective with, on the future of journalism in the world today? Uh, I'm really excited. I mean, obviously, journalism is under a, uh, an industry challenge. The entire media model that I grew up with has been disrupted. You know, when I got out of, uh, I went to University of Michigan and worked at the Michigan Daily. And in my generation, you got out and you got a job at a newspaper or a TV station. And you worked there, in my case, for the next 33 years. Um, this generation um, may not get out and get a job as much as get out and make a job. You know, you come out equipped with these digital skills and video skills and audio skills that my generation really didn't get. So you know how to do a lot more. You may end up setting up your own uh, website, like Tom Grundy set up the Hong Kong Free Press. Uh, you may end up doing your own blogs. You may end up doing your own online uh, journalism. But there's a lot of more opportunities now uh, for journalists than there ever was before. And it doesn't necessarily entail getting a job at the Washington Post and staying there for the next 33 years and making your way up the ladder. I mean, uh, you guys are already in Hong Kong. It took me uh, 20 years before I got to Hong Kong as a Washington Post correspondent. But it's an exciting time to be in journalism, and I think never a more important time uh, to be a journalist. I mean, we see the challenges that journalists are under, even in the United States right now. If you've just watched the last president elect press conference, never has there been a bigger, a bigger, more important challenge for journalists to get out there, start uncovering stories, and start telling stories. You know, in my generation got into journalism because of Watergate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we all watched all the president's men and decided that there was no greater important job in the world than being a journalist. And I think there might be a whole other generation of journalists coming in to do that same thing. So I think it's an exciting time to be a journalist. There is all this disruption in the industry. Don't pay attention to that. Come here. Our, our grads get jobs. Our grads get internships. Um, I remind you to please stay in touch with us. Find us on our website. Find us on Twitter. Don't forget that January 31st deadline. If you're going to go off and study, uh, celebrate Chinese New Year, get your application in beforehand. If you started the application, try to finish it so we can get you through the process. I want to thank everybody for all those great questions. I mean, uh, fantastic questions coming in and for staying engaged with us here. I want to thank uh, our students for being here. I want to thank AJ for his dancing. He's <laughs> back in the control room back there. And uh, everybody, stay in face. Find us uh, in touch with us. Find us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Definitely go to our YouTube channel and look up some of that really cool stuff up there and look up the, uh, look up the student stuff on the website. Stay in touch with us. 
And uh, thanks, students. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> All right. And thanks to our great team. We got the best looking team in broadcast journalism back there working behind the booth. And I want to say uh, good night to everybody uh, if you're in the Asian region. Good night. We're in Hong Kong, so I'll say good night. If you're in New York or Canada just waking up, good morning. You can go have your breakfast now. Um, if you're in Europe, you can go have lunch. So I want to thank everybody. I think this webinar will be available online at some point after we get it up in case uh, in case you overslept or you didn't make it on, you will be able to see it later on. You can see what our students had to say. So I want to say thanks again. Um, you know, we just, this is our first broadcast from our brand new uh, JMSC production studios here. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>